for the next hour or so. Probably it will be less than an hour. Um, first of all, I'm really pleased to see um, quite a large number of you. Um, although you, it might be the first time you ever had my lecture. Uh, I'm Minzi, uh, one of the lecturers on uh, computer graphics, or computer games programming program. And um, today, as part of your uh, subject in computer science, I'm going to introduce to you uh, the area of uh, the field of computer graphics. Um, it's kind of, it's going to be a very brief introduction. And it's a broad subject, but I think a lot of you, raise your hand if you actually play video games. It's, a, it's all of you, right? So, you have seen computer graphics um, since ever, whenever you start playing video games. Therefore, graphics is not kind of an unfamiliar term to most of us. But what I want to do is to perhaps look back to the history of computer graphics and kind of guide you into this subject area to see what computer graphics is really about. And even for you, not doing video games, not making video games, what computer graphics can do um, as part of computer science uh, subject or general computing subject. So, um, in today's talk, the overview will be, um, I want to define, it, roughly define what computer graphics is. So, what do we, what, when you study computer graphics, or what we do works in computer graphics, what do we normally do with it? Um, and, and I will guide you through some of the very important work in computer graphics. And I will show them, I, try to demonstrate, I will demonstrate them with some of the um, videos and um, images uh, from those work to give you an idea about how do we get to the graphics we see today, whether you play games on the console or whether you play games on a very high-end PC, how do, we, um, how do we actually get to the current point? And, and then we'll look at some applications beyond entertainment, beyond games and films. Uh, we'll see how computer graphics can benefit, can bring benefits to other area of science or life in general. So, without further ado, um, so computer graphics. So in here, uh, two very simple images. One is a, one is a sphere, one is a keyboard. They are rendered, they are computer generated, you can tell by how faint they <coughs> look. Uh, one of the sphere looks really plasticky. Um, the, the keyboard here is also very plasticky look like some, um, well, it does look like a computer generated Im image. Um, there's nothing special about sphere, it's a geometric <coughs> object, and all of uh, The teapot actually has a name, has a specific name to it, and uh, it will appear throughout this lecture, probably uh, a, few a few more times. This teapot is known as Utah, Utah teapot. It came from the place in birth of Utah, and I will go into a bit more detail when, when I introduce some work important work from that university. So, when we talk about computer graphics, we generally, the visible elements of computer graphics is the image we see, right? We, whatever we see through display or this data, you have Oculus Rift, um, you have Google Glass. Um, the end product of computer graphics is an image we can see. But in order to generate this image, we have to consider two very important questions. First of all is, how can we actually represent an object in, in, um, in, in computer, for instance? Um, in, your, in your first year, uh, in first term, you encounter some, prob some fundamental problem of representing an integer in computer would be a stream of bits, right? So can we apply the same logic, uh, same kind of model onto a computer, uh, onto an object, a sphere with, with a keyboard. And the second question we want to ask when we're dealing with computer graphics is, um, given a plausible representation, say we can describe a, uh, a sphere in, in some form or the other, and how can we actually make them appear on the screen? How can we actually um, color or shade you like, um, the, 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 the object? And actually apply this sphere here is actually being lit by light source coming from kind of this this way in front of it. So there's a light source in front of it. That's why I see, see highlights uh, on the sphere. So 
second problem we have to deal with is giving a representation of an object. How do we shape it? So that's the two key questions. So in computer graphics, when we started uh, when we studied this subject or we work on the subject, the two fundamental problems we address are modeling and rendering. These two words come out a lot um, in computer graphics textbook. So Firstly, what we would do is to look at the problem of modeling. Um, in terms of modeling, um, that's one thing. Uh, if you start, if you will start computer graphics next year, you will see a, a few of these places. But the whole modeling is about um, the point of modeling is allow us to create a uh, method to have a plausible representation of a geometrical object and. Being able to describe the shape, the size, the angle, it is fairly important in computer graphics. Um, in order to do this, we have to actually look back about uh, before Jesus Christ was born um, from Euclid. Anyone heard of Euclid? Well done. Um, Euclid is often credited as the father of um, geometry. <coughs> he proposed it was 300. 200 BC, and he proposed a way of describing shapes you know, through angle, size, distance, this kind of uh, quantity. And, but it wasn't until about um, Descartes, uh, a French mathematician, who unified the notion of geometry and algebra. One of the, one of the most influential contributions from Descartes is Cartesian coordinates. Anyone use Cartesian coordinates? So, Descartes actually, um, the Cartesian coordinates actually allowed us to have a model of an object and also allowed us to draw this object so we can see it. So, if you look at these four equations, right, if you can recognize any of them, it would be great, and uh, although that's supposed to be raised to the power of two, not. not uh, Arrow, I don't know why it's turned into this, <coughs> um, this arrow sign. So, can anyone recognize of any of these equations? Tell me what they are. First equation. Anyone have a recollection from early years? No, uh, the equation for a gradient. Okay. There's a gradient in there, yes. And what do you get when you have a gradient? Straight line, right? A straight line, right. So, well done. So that's the first equation for, for a straight line. So it precisely tells me if I have a coordinate system with x, y coordinates, if x, y satisfy this some form, an equation of this form, then this, uh, this point x, y actually lies on the line. So this expression here allows us to describe a line. Okay. So uh, it's a two-dimensional line. So when you have two coordinates, and uh, how about the next one? Anyone? Sorry? There's X and Y. Uh, it has an additional component for Z. Right. So, again, if you want to move on to higher dimension, um, the second equation is actually a plane. So if you extend the line into third dimension, that becomes a plane. So now we have the ability to describe a plane in, the, in, in 3D. That's, that's mightily important if, I, if I'm standing on here, I try to find out whether I'm, I'm on the uh, top side of this floor or the, or the bottom side of this floor. The plane equation can tell me. So it's, a very, uh, it's going to be very useful uh, when, when, we, when we're describing the world, when we later see, when we're trying to describe an object, whether it's a room with walls or a simple teapot <coughs> or a sphere. Um, the next two, the, 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 the symbol is a bit messed up. It's basically, uh, the first one is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Um, try to make a guess what it is. It is a circle, right? So <laughs> this equation tells us any points, given x, y, any point in the Cartesian coordinates, if it, its distance to uh, to the origin is R, then it, all these points form a circle. So, the, 
point is, when we study geometry, whether it's in secondary school, maybe or later on in A level, um, you will encounter some kind of algebra, uh, algebra expression of a shape. And often to draw it, using the partition, you will get an x, y, partition coordinates. To draw a line, if I know it's, uh, say, to draw a line given, say, the line is x equals to y, we know it's a diagonal line. To draw a circle, given a um, certain radius, we just plot enough points along the circle, and you get a circle. So this gives us tremendous amount of ability to describe geometry shape already. Um, and if you're curious about the third one, uh, it's basically an extension of three dimensions. So we actually, this equation describes a sphere of, um, of radius r. So several hundred years ago, not even the emergence of computing, we have the ability to already do drawing and describe geometry shape. And now if we move on this uh, idea of modeling into computer world, if you make analogy between de describing an integer in discrete bytes to de describing an object or shape or the world in discrete geometry elements. In computer graphics, the modeling approach is slightly different. This expression is still useful. This expression allows us to, um, to calculate, to work out whether, whether, for instance, if you have two circles, you make a game. Bounding circles allows you to uh, find out whether two objects collide. Um, if you have a plane, you can find out whether certain object is inside another object or whether it's intersecting. So this fundamental uh, algebra actually allows us, in, when, when we're doing the, the graphics problem, allows us to do very um, analytical um, calculation on intersections, collisions. They are very useful. But in terms of actually producing visual elements and modeling the world, we, use a, we tend to use a more discrete approach in the, in the world, uh, in, the, in the world of computer graphics. Um, one of the simplest forms of modeling an object in computer graphics is to use what's known as polygonal model. So if I actually reveal the underlying structure of that keyboard, uh, it's a bit messy, but this is a rendered uh, produced by one of the former one of the students, um, uh, she was on the uh, graphics one project. She wrote a software renderer to render the wireframe of a key of the APAR people. And you can see from this rendition here that the shape, the entire geometric shape of the keyboard is made up of a finite number of small triangles. So, one of the, uh, the one of the simplest form of representing a model in computer graphics is known as piecewise linear approximation. Now, the term seems to be a uh, mouthful. It's piecewise because we have a finite number of very basic geometric shape, like a triangle, and it's linear because triangle is a plane. Therefore, a 3D models, in its essence, in computer graphics, is a collection of finite number of planes. This is quite similar to, you know, if you do, if you do with uh, integer, 32-bit integer is made of um, 32 uh, bits. Therefore, they have a certain range and uh, they can represent a number. The same with floating point, the uh, single float has a uh, limited precision compared to double float. So, so the same idea when it's applied in computer. So computer graphics also have the same number of, um, uh, also limited by this discretization. So we actually break down the models into um, into um, smaller pieces of linear elements, more common triangles. Um, if you ever seen uh, some CGMA students, you know, when the second year, first year, uh, when they create models, they generally do with the creation of these uh, polygons and hopefully they will have some nice looking model. Um, so, in fact, polygonal model is the, uh, the basic data structure or data used in today's computer graphics. Anything you can see in games, uh, especially in real time uh, application of games, all the models you acquire are mostly in polygonal model. We'll 
talk about these advancements in a bit uh, towards the end of the lecture, how, how the landscape will be changed when other, other kinds of uh, model representations is available. So, moving on, if we want a more elaborate version of a more sophisticated version of, uh, of a surface, we can use uh, what's often called a higher order model. So, the difference between higher order model and model is the in the, in, in the polygonal model, where every polygon is a flat plane, whereas in the higher order model, the model are constructed based on patches. These patches are flexible patches, they're just smooth surface. They are high order because they, they require quadratic uh, second degree equation, um, so uh, polynomial. Um, so a common one used would be nerves, nerves or derived from B splines. It's used a lot in films like Pixar films we'll be seeing in a bit. Uh, some of the Pixar films, especially from Toy Story onward, where they start becoming a mainstream genre in the, in, in the, in the, in the theater. Um, nerves modeling is a, a, a lot more robust and allows us to describe smooth surface. So if you look at the people, the, the data used to describe the, the people is no longer the triangular as previous. But instead, it's described by this hole here, that this black line here describes the, uh, the piecewise patch. And the underlying surface is in light, and light no, nowhere near the, the hole, but it's a smooth, it represents a smooth surface of the people. And the advantage of higher order model also, it allows it to, to apply deformation more easily. Because what's been described is a deformable smooth surface. We'll see some video in a bit. Um, and, and more recently, um, especially towards the um, end of uh, 1990 to 90s, um, we start seeing subdivision surface. Subdivision surface is something, a uh, great contribution from, um, from some of the people from Pixar. Um, they, are a, they are actually based on the idea of patches, but because of the, um, the nature of calculating the surface by subdivision, they have eased off lots of um, what we call topological constraints on, on the geometry. So we can actually do very complicated shapes, like even the number one finger uh, used to be a very difficult uh, pass to, to model accurately for fields. Um, now it's Model with ease uh, with subdivision surface. Um, there are all out of these two types of modeling technique. There are also other. If you consider, there are things which simply cannot describe. If you think uh, the things like terrain, mountain, cloud, we simply have no way of describing it to be on shape. Either it evolves or it's just too complex to describe. Um, so there are other modeling techniques known as you know, fractal based. Uh, which is very uh, common in, in modeling terrains and our system as well for modeling trees. Uh, we'll see in the video demonstrating some of this uh, modeling technique uh, in, in, in one of the latest game management. So, what we have seen so far is the modeling side of it. Uh, it's similar form, it's, it's, it's very similar to uh, uh, modeling a computer. Uh, computerized object. It's very similar to modeling numbers and values in, in, in a system. Right? Discretization would break things into into a finite number of chunks and and put them together. They approximate the shape. Now, once we have this uh, uh, modeling, uh, the model, the approach to describe shapes, the second step to think about is actually how do we display it. Now, what we start is the, the rendering aspect of uh, the, uh, of computer graphics. So, what I want, what I want to illustrate here is so you have a tight interceptor here, uh, which if it's rendered in wireframe, we know that it's it's a collection. It's made up of a collection of um, of polygons. But how do we actually render a picture that shapes the interior of the polygon and also uh, applied lighting, so it gives, it's not realistic, but it gives a sense of realism. Uh, without lighting, um, a lot of computer generated graphics are not that interesting to look at. So, how do we do this? Um, when I teach rendering, I 
like to, as many problems you, you want to formulate in computer science or in computing in general, is to, to look at the whole process as a pipeline. So, where we begin with is a geometrical model. So we have a representation either using equation, using polygonal model, or we have a model. These are the data. So any, any soft field in, in any software <coughs> is a good quote to talk about software is simply data and algorithms put together, which is a software, right? So for computer graphics software, what we have the data is the geometric model of objects we're interested in. Um, so that would be one object. If it's a game of objects, environments, and lots of other things going on. Um, and, and then we look into the output. In today's graphic, a lot of the output of a graphical system is pretty much the frame buffer. So the frame buffer is a collection of uh, pixels, basically. If, if that eventually maps onto the display, that's where you get to see the contents of uh, computer-generated graphics. So, since we know where the data comes, we know the data, we know where the data should go. So the rendering itself fits nicely between these two, um, between these two uh, locations. Um, so what I, what 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 we should know about in, in rendering is there are fundamentally two processes in, in, in rendering. One is called geometric processing, is where because we often do not render a, a still image. We render animation. Therefore, there's a processing called geometry processing. Its, its role is to apply transformation. Transformation is a series of you know, movement, displacement, rotation that's applied to the, um, to, the, to, to the model. And the second important part is rasterization. Now, rasterization is a very specific term um, for, for today's graphics. I mean, today, for the past 20 years, we, we are dealing with rasterization. That's because the frame buffer itself is a rectangular block of pixels. So the role of rasterization is to work out for each polygon in the <coughs> projected onto the frame buffer and to work out the coverage of the polygon and then determine the pixel color that's covered by the, the color of the pixel covered by the by the polygon. So that in essence is what rendering is about. It's about discovering whether a polygon is visible and, and then subsequently determine what color this polygon should be. And the color is determined by several things, uh, many factors, right? If I'm wearing a red shirt, I can say it's red color. But then when the color, when the object is lit by a light source, the color also changes. That's why we get a, you know, a kind of dynamic looking objects, um, dynamically lit objects from, from the finally produced image. There's a gradient of color change due to the lighting. So the rust, in the rasterization process, not only we determine the visibility, but we also determine how much the light contributes to the, to the color of the pixel, color of the polygon. So, all right, okay, so the next one would be a bit terrifying, but um, that's, it's, it's also wrong. I really don't know what's going on with all this stuff. Right. The, the reason I, I want to bring up, I think I, think I will fix the slides. Uh, there shouldn't be an error there, and that should be, there shouldn't be anything there either. Um, no, I talk, I talk about it, this idea is, it, it's, 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 it's not too good there, it's, it's actually good there to, to tell you how how equation can actually sometimes express a very complex idea. So we talked about previously the pipeline, the rendering pipeline is to determine the color or the lighting, the color or the lighting of a specific point on the surface. So in 86, uh, this guy called James Kajia, he, he actually proposed the whole rendering process into the fit the whole rendering process into this situation. So what you can see in this equation is um, the function i here is basically determined, trying to determine the color or the intensity of the points on the surface. And in order to do so, what we need to first determine is this arrow is all pointing in the wrong direction. Which I need to fix. Um, the function g here is something related to the visibility term. It's basically a term telling whether a certain point 
surface is visible to the light. So what will happen if the surface is not visible to the light, what we call it? Anyone know? Shadow? <coughs> it's a shadow, yeah? So that's how we actually can generate shadow. Without shadow, we also find the environment pretty boring and it's not physically correct. So the whole equation here not only allows us the first term here, the G term is a, it's called a geometric term basically. It tells us whether it's the visibility and this epsilon term here. This function, we will have emissive object, right? We will have object that actually emits light. Therefore, this is emissive term. This tells us the color of a surface point, not only determined by the light, uh, the light that shines on the surface, but it also will, 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 will have to take into account whether this is a, um, a point on the surface that actually emits light. If it does, we we'll have to take that into account. And the last bit is, the last bit with the integral here, is actually where all the today's game engine, today's rendering engine goes towards. This is actually the global illumination term. It's, if you consider an environment, the lighting on a particular point in the environment does not only just come from the light source itself, it actually comes from the, uh, the light that's scattered off from neighboring surface. Um, show you a picture of uh, why this is important. So this uh, row, this term row, is actually scattered light from, from surrounding surfaces. Now, if we traverse further, you can see I actually occurred again as a function on the right-hand side of the equation. Can anyone tell me what does this mean? A function occurs on the right-hand side of the function. Anyone heard of a recursion? Mm -hmm. That's a recursion. So that means, in fact, the rendering process is a, is a recursive process. This can be better demonstrated with uh, a, a mirror. Uh, a mirror, if you, if, you, if you stand in front of the mirror, if you have a mirror facing the mirror, you will find the light actually bouncing between the two mirrors, give an in, infinite recursion. Uh, recursive uh, um, reflection. The same thing occurs in, in rendering is when light strikes the surface, it starts about scattering off, and those scattered off light becomes a light source itself. So we have to do the whole rendering again. So that's a recursive nature in this um, in this whole rendering process. And there are a lot of people working on it to represent every single stage in, in describing this uh, in this rendering. So, the, the people I want to introduce and the work I want to introduce is a long list. We don't go back to the history. I, I would rather show you a video of how, how this all come together, uh, become today's program. But this is a list of people. Um, University of Utah is something we, we, uh, we honor a lot as computer graphics, especially for people who work in games, because they have given us what computer graphics is like today. So the work coming from computer, uh, uh, from, from University of Utah, you will see some of the things you might have heard of, right? Uh, texture mapping. In games, texture is everywhere to, to actually produce the surface detail. Uh, for lighting, environment mapping. Um, it's about uh, producing reflective surface. And bump mapping is a very it has been, become a very um, uh, become a standard uh, modeling technique today, especially from uh, for the console world uh, from 360 and PS3 onwards. Uh, the use of normal map is actually originated from computer, and they have given us uh, a set of important work and algorithms that actually we use extensively today, not just in uh, especially. In so without too much, so what I want to show you now is a it's a short film from uh, Pixar. It's worthwhile mentioning uh, this guy called Catmo. He is uh, he actually went on to become the president of Pixar Studios. So he's one of the guy who produced this uh, short animation. You may notice the 
lag at the lens of the project. This is um I think this 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 short film often um <coughs> been regarded as kind of one of the first computer generated um film with storyline. You can see this uh, uh mischievous uh, little baby lab. And both that lab has become kind of iconic um uh, logo for Pixar. So it was produced in the 80s. <coughs> it's, it's not it's not real time rendering. It's off time, off time rendering. But what has, what is shown off is the amount of the, the 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 demonstration of the research work came from um, those people. You know, the the floor here. What is that? That's it's modeled using textures. So the wood grains are textures. So that's the first time you get to see the. Uh, There's uh, the problem we have to deal with is the, 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 the geometry for the for the wire, the cable, and the geometry for the for the lamp. And of course we can notice the lighting here as well, it's more the spotlight lighting, you know, uh, the, the light, the lit area and the softly lit surrounding area which is partly in shadow, partly not in shadow, and the shadow. And the deformable object described by uh, using Spline, which allows us to easily describe the definition of a uh, simple sphere in this case. And the sphere itself is also textured. So it's offline rendering, but it's so it's so pivotal that some people actually call this a the first food uh, feature film, film is, uh, film is um, And of course we know Pixar from then onward has went on to do to produce a lot more um, Especially since the era of um, of Toy Story, um, and they actually defined the genre of um, computer animated, uh, computer the CG movie uh, genre. So this is um, the example in eighties. So if we return to our lecture, what we have been talking about uh, in terms of the rendering is. been focusing on um, the term global illumination. And 
global information is a way of generating what is known as a photorealistic uh, rendering. So in the 80s, there's, um, there's an experiment done at the Cornell University. Um, this is a very, this is another very iconic kind of experiment setting. It's called the Cornell box. It's nothing elaborate. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of box room with painted wall. And inside the room, there's a light source on the top. And um, the tall box at the back contains a mirror-like surface. And the, the, the shorter box front has a mat rough surface. But what it demonstrates is several ideas. This, this global image idea is generated from ray tracing and radio. The idea of ray tracing is if we, if we consider how human eye actually see the world, we see the world because the light bounces off objects and enters to our eyes. So from any angle in front of our eyes, there are millions infinite number of rays entered through our eyes. That's how we see it. <coughs> so in the rendering term, when people try to capture photorealism, they try to emulate this effect by, by doing the process for ray tracing. It's given an imaginary camera you want to do a computer generated graphics. And we try to capture all possible rays that go through the camera. And have, but instead of doing this uh, entering, we, um, in, instead of doing this forward when the ray enters our eyes, they do it backward. So backward ray tracing is a very popular way. So from the camera point of view, we shoot the ray into the scene and try to identify what surface the ray hits. And when the ray hits a surface, it recurs. That's where the equation has a recursion. It recurs and generates reflection on the mirror surface. That's why we can render a picture uh, with, uh, of, of a reflection of the um, box in front of the mirror. So that's one part of global This one 
is like a ceramic keyboard model, uh, ceramic keyboard, with a layer of kind uh, of of glaze. With that kind of material, one thing people consider is the uh, what they call it, sub subsurface scattering. Because when the light strikes the surface, as same as our skin, if our skin actually have, is made up of uh, multiple layers, therefore when the light, uh, light strikes our skin, it actually penetrates first the layer, first layer of skin, and then some scattering occurs underneath the skin layer. So to actually render uh, human skin is quite a challenging um, task as well um, in film production. But this is what um, this is kind of a trend in in real time graphics, especially for games. People start exploring a more dynamic or more physically correct way of describing material. So. What I'll do is show you uh, the, uh, a clip from Unreal Engine 4. Um, this is a quite a nice demo because it shows up several advanced features I just talked about. Let's see if you can spot some of them. Um, things like uh, scattering and into reflection. In the very early stage, you can, you can see some kind of uh, radiosity, this, this scattering of light from the clock. Now it's also on volumetric effect. You will see things like storms, uh, snow, dust, um, this lava. And the, the, the aim is also to make them behave more physically correct. So this lava actually behaves like behaves like very uh, thick fluid. So you can see this. This is um, kind of one of the most recent iteration of Unreal Engine. There are noticeable trends in those game engine design, whether, uh, especially from rendering point of view. Whether you look into Crytek as uh, CryEngine or um, Tech Fire Engine from ID, or even Frostbite, global illumination has become a very um, has become focused on uh, rendering and design. Uh, having said that, in today's uh, game engine, rendering engine design, a lot of those effects are still done as a post-processing uh, project, where they occurred in the two-dimensional space, as if you apply a, um, a Photoshop filter, that type of uh, operation. But the, the advancement, if you uh, Looking to follow some of the uh, development of this, it, um, people try to do it at re real time in full three dimensional space. So
So this is um, what today is like compared to the 80s, right? In the 80s, we can't do those things uh, in, we can only do the, achieve those effects with offline rendering. Um, now, those are known as photorealistic rendering. We try to replicate how light interacts with surface, how this environment looks like with certain lighting. Um, as physically accurate uh, as possible. That's called realism. Earth realism. Um, there's another branch of um, uh, rendering called non photorealistic rendering. So, um, I think it came out in 94 <coughs> when uh, this two guy actually demonstrated the pen and ink sketch for a uh, uh, rendering of a house. So, um, non photorealistic rendering used a lot in video games as well. So, um, some of them early one, just a radio. Design and manufacturing is, is also uh, very obvious um, application. Um, another way is um, visualization. With the, with the ability of you know, modeling um, geometry and, and, and rendering it, visualization has become a very important tool uh, in pushing forward kind of scientific understanding. Um, so, for instance, this is a screenshot from. Uh, uh, from a tool for ultra scale climate data, I can't remember what it is, uh, basically UV CAT, uh, CDAC, um, and analysis and visualization. I can't remember what the whole name is. But this shows um, the cl climate art, uh, scientists, they, they, they rely on a lot of visualization of geography, um, geographical data, I believe. <coughs> And the climate data, this is the density of the, um, uh, of the cloud, uh, of the water particle uh, in, in the atmosphere to understand the, the behavior of climate, right? We probably don't know why we have some terrible weather this Christmas. Um, but being able to visualize it and look back or even project forward, we'll be able to tell uh, why uh, or relate uh, why climate behavior. So this is to do with temporal spatial data, basically time lapse data and spatial data. Uh, another one I, I did some work in is uh, medical visualization. So in the very early stage, this guy called Bill Lawrence, he, um, he, he proposed this way of called marching cube algorithm to actually render um, scans from CT data. If you have been uh, fortunate to, uh, if, if you're fortunate enough to actually have a 
Thank you for your attention.